Back in 2007, I planned to write an article for a major English daily of Pakistan, Dawn. The reason was that it was 2007, 150th year of the first war of independence. And of course I was reading and people were writing about it. I headed to Punjab Archives Department. There I did my bit of research and the question that I was finding an answer to was whether we fought a war of independence in 1857 or whether it was a mutiny as was dubbed by the erstwhile colonizers. Now based on that research, I wrote the article and I argued that it in fact was a war of independence and not just a mutiny. The article got published in the month of May 2007 with the title, The Mutiny at Lahore. Well, it was symptomatic of something larger. It was symptomatic of our deeply embedded colonial conceptions. And, of course, it is this conception which makes us gullible most of the times. Because it is a narrative which tells us, convinces us, at a subconscious level, that we have nothing to celebrate in our past. That in our past, we were never creative. We were never innovative. We did not have any progressive attitudes that we never liked democratic dispensation. It is conception of this kind, for example, which would make us readily accept and believe the narrative that was propagated a few years ago on a major Pakistani television channel. The narrative went like this, that while we or our rulers were busy building the Taj Mahal, rulers from other parts of the world were busy building Oxford and Cambridge universities. Now, of course, this is ridiculously anachronistic because the Taj Mahal was built in 17th century. Oxford and Cambridge universities were built in 11th and 13th centuries. Such a conception of our past, which a Latin American writer calls mutilated memory, such a conception would stop us from accessing the fact that the ruler of this, that the builder of this magnificent edifice, the designer who built this amazing structure, designed it, which continues to enthrall and enchant tourists from all over the world, even after 300 years of its construction, was from this very town. Ustad Ahmad Lahari. Such a conception would not take us to a point where we, may, where we are able to think about the skill, the craft, the engineering, the innovation, the creation, and the magnificent team effort that would have gone into the creation of the Taj Mahal. Now, of course, such a conception would also not allow us to access our past and know about universities of Nalanda and universities of and University of Texla. And in the words of inimitable Shashi Tharoor, these universities existed in our part of the world long before Oxford and Cambridge were not even gleams in the eyes of their founders. Well, I've been teaching for over 17 years now. And when I interact with my students initially, in their first year, they come with this subconscious understanding of their past. And of course it's reflected in their body language. When I interact with them and I ask them, where do you think you've come from? And where do you think you are headed? Because they don't remember where they have come from, 
an overwhelming majority, almost 99% of them would say, they don't know where they are heading. They don't know what they want to do with their lives. Now this crucial component of history, which of course interacts with us, converses with us at a subconscious level, it is telling us that our past has nothing to offer, that we must not go there into our past. That if we have to be scientific, creative, progressive, democratic, we have to look elsewhere. And there is nothing in our own context that we can, of course, look up to. This conception would, of course, not tell them that they live in a part of, a wor in a part of the world where something which is called the greatest of human inventions, a zero, was invented. And by the way, the oldest manuscript in the whole world which employs this zero was found in a Pakistani village called Bakshali. Of course, the manuscript, it does exist. Such a conception would not tell them that in 17th century Hazara, water-powered looms, the first in the world, were operating and by using those water-powered looms, figured cotton and silk and brocades of the highest quality were made and exported to the rest of the world. Such a mutilated memory, of course, would not tell them that it was Kashmir of 17th century where horticulturists were experimenting with creation of new fruits through grafting. And of course, since this is TEDx Lahore, we are standing here, such a conception would not tell them that for over a hundred years, the best and the most accurate astrolabes, which were also called celestial globes, which were utilized for astronomical observations and for navigation in high seas, all ships made in India had one fitted in them, that the best and accurate, most accurate astrolabes were made by a family of Lahore. And to date, we have those extant astrolabes which have signatures of members of the same family. And of course, another astrolabe which is found, which is there on display in a university in Varnasi, has inscriptions of Sanskrit, inscriptions in Sanskrit and Arabic written side by side on it. Such a beautiful display of peaceful encounter of cultures. And by the way, that precisely was the reason why such innovation and creativity was possible. Because how can I not mention the fact that in 1600 AD, when Giordano Bruno was being burnt alive in Europe, for proposing the heliocentric model of the universe at the behest of religious clergy there, in our part of the world in 1600 AD, we had just finished instituting a law allowing religious freedom. And during the same years, a Muslim ruler got translated an ancient sacred text of Hindus, Bhagavad Gita, translated into Persian. A beautiful illustrated version still exists. It was the same Muslim ruler who got translated an 11th century treatise on mathematics called Leelavati in Persian language. Such was the understanding of the value which other cultures and other religions and other denominations had. And it goes a long way, the story of interdependence. Even a person as maligned, maligned in history texts as Aurangzeb Alamgir, who is otherwise known for his religiosity. He was the one, according to Professor Audrey Trushke, I strongly recommend her book, Aurangzeb Alamgir, The Man and the Myth, in which he writes that it was Aurangzeb Alamgir who employed the most number of Hindu doctors and scholars in his service. 
and he of course gave stipends to construct Hindu temples and of course he supported other religions like Brahmins as well. You can read the text, she is a very rigorous scholar and historian. And of course, as I said, this history of pluralism, understanding difference, it is really very long. Even in 20th century, when of course a large part of the world, in a large part of the world, people were at each other's throats. And when of course in a large civilized continent, people had just, or governments, I should probably be more accurate, had just finished killing off 380 million people at the end of the First World War. A scholar from our part of the world who had roamed the streets and alleys of this town, Ubaidullah Sindhi, he proposed the idea of Kasirul Qami. And in a detailed political document, he proposed that why is it important for us to accept mononational conceptions of a country? Why can't we accept a plurinational conception of a country? Of course, he was advanced by decades as the first country which called itself, which proudly call, calls itself the plurinational state of Bolivia, acquired this name, I think, just a decade ago. So when I talk about past, I mean remembrance. I interact with my students and I tell them that they need to realize that they too are part of a beautiful human rainbow. That the colors of this beautiful human rainbow are probably faded and they, by their act of remembrance, need to refurbish it. Back in 2008, I wrote on the need to decolonize our knowledge and on the need to indigenize it. Eight years later, in 2016, along with six of my intellectually minded colleagues, I set up a forum, a think tank, if you may, at the university where I work now, Punjab University, it's called Indigenizing Knowledge Forum. Of course, we've got a long way to go. We need to decolonize not just our minds, not just individuals, but also our institutions. And I think my students are going to lead me in this effort. Thank you very much.